This show is brought to you by Champagne Pommery from France. You may think we're in the land of Oz, but we're really in the land of Champagne. This is so magical. You can do anything here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special show from our series, Cuisine and Folklore Around the World. What makes this show so special? It's because we're in the land that gives birth to the most expensive fruit in the world. We're in the land of Champagne in northern France. You see, in our show today, we're going to visit a very historic city and learn how champagne is made. We're also going to cook, which is your favorite part of the show, I know. You're going to learn why this area is so important in the production of that luxurious, bubbly beverage that we all love. I've chosen one of the classiest champagne houses there is, the House of Pummery, with a history as proud as the wine itself. So come with us today and learn how champagne is made. First, we're going to start in the ancient city of Reims. This city was named after the Celtic tribe, the Remi, who came here long before the Romans. The Romans came in 496, and they built monuments to glorify their gods. I'm standing right now under the original gateway to the city of Reims that the Romans built in about 470. You know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Reims was actually a more popular city than Paris because it was here that the great kings of France were coronated. You know, every time I see those spooky gargoyles on the outsides of cathedrals, I just expect to see that creepy hunchback from Notre Dame peeking his head around the corner at me. No, but seriously, this cathedral is named Notre Dame too, like the one in Paris. And I don't need historians to tell me that it is the beautiful, the most beautiful example of Gothic architecture anywhere in the world. You see the three doors in the front? That's probably the cathedral's finest features. And also, do you see that huge rose window right above the middle door? That is a perfect example of Gothic architecture. And also, if you have time to count, there are over a thousand different statues and figurines that line the outside of this cathedral. It is exquisite! lies in its champagne, and I've chosen one of the classiest champagne houses in this entire area, the House of Pummery, with a history that's as proud as the wine itself. So come on with me now and find out how this classy, luxurious beverage is made. First, I want you to understand why this region produces the only true sparkling champagne in the world. You see, the champagne that we know is named after a specific region in the northeast of France. The fine quality of the champagne is due to three important factors, the soil, the climate, and the labor of man. Geographically, champagne's terrain is a miracle, perfect for grape vineyards. Clay, sand, and ash combine to make the ground rich in nutrients. The sun's rays reflect off the topsoil of chalk to keep the vineyards warm and light year-round. And underneath, the subsoil is a deep bed of chalk, too. And once the wine is bottled, it matures and ages beneath the earth in these chalk wine cellars. There are 15,000 wine growers in the Champagne region and 20 big, world-famous houses of merchants. Pommery exports two-thirds of the wine, and the 600 acres of vineyards owned by Pommery are ranked in the 99.1 percentile for production, a figure that's unequaled anywhere in the Champagne world. Champagne is a white wine made from three different kinds of grapes, the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, and the Pinot Meunier. For over 20 centuries, these vine stocks have been planted and harvested by careful hands. You know, one interesting thing is that until the 17th century, wines produced in the Champagne area were not sparkling or bubbly as we know them today. It wasn't until the reign of Louis XIV that the sparkling champagne industry was born. And then, about a hundred years later, as champagne exportation began to flourish throughout the world, a man named Louis Alexandre Pummery founded the House of Pummery. As with all beginnings, the start was a little bit rocky, but the quality of the champagne spread its fame all over. 
You see, the founders, with a good business sense, realized that it would be smart to conquer the market in Europe. And so the quality of Pummery went into England, France, the Netherlands, Brussels, Italy, Switzerland, and Germany. In the late 1800s, Louise Pummery took over the business after her husband's death. She traveled a lot in England and Scotland to promote the sale of her Brut Champagne. Oh, Brut is a word that I'll explain a little bit later on. When she was there, it is rumored that she fell in love with the Elizabethan architecture. And so when she came back here to Reims in 1870, she used as the models for the offices of Pummery the beautiful castles and chateaus that she'd seen there. In the 1800s, the champagne that was drunk was very sweet. Madame Pummery panicked because she thought that people drinking sweet wine would only want to drink it with sweet desserts. So here's where her genius came into play. She created a special dry vat or cuvee of champagne called Pummery Nature 1874. This encouraged connoisseurs to turn from the sweet wines that they were used to and start drinking the classy dry champagnes that we know today. The House of Pummery continued to grow, and by the turn of the century, it was exporting over two million bottles of wine. It's no wonder that it rose to the top of the elite wine production houses. But there are more reasons, other than just the number of bottles produced, that caused Pummery to excel. Now, I've already told you that Pummery had a high, high regard for quality. Let me tell you something interesting you may not know. In this area of Champagne, there are strict laws regulating the production of all Champagne. Here's an example of Pummery's quality. The law states that after one year, a bottle of Champagne is mature enough to be sold. Pummery thinks this is ridiculous, because any fine, quality Champagne needs from three to five years to mature. It's this aging in cool cellars that allows the bubbles to form naturally and the high quality of Champagne to come forth. We have just walked 116 steps down into the chalk wine cellars of Pummery. And all around us for 10 miles are the rest of the Pummery wine cellars. Now I want to impress you with the size of these cellars. It would take three Rose Bowl stadiums to hold the chalk wine cellars of Pummery. Madame Pummery in the late 1870s had these cellars built into the Roman chalk pit that she bought. It is very dark and spooky down here. And so I've asked one of the directors of Pummery to be my bodyguard. He also knows a lot about champagne. I've asked him to explain some of the things around me that I don't understand. I'd like you to meet Patrick Bertrand. Bonjour. Bonjour, Suzanne. Could you please explain to me what's in back of us here? The Virgin watching over the Pope's wine. <laughs> now, let's be serious. Uh, actually, this is a statue that has been founded in the, um, in the United States and that we brought back about a hundred years ago in Pommery and as it belongs to the French school of architecture and sculpture we thought it was nice to be in that mood, you know, in that cellar. And I see the statue is actually overlooking these bottles. Could you tell me why the bottles are tipped like this with their necks down? This is for the main, uh, main part of the life and the birth of Champagne. Patrick, can you explain to me what this man is doing? Well, this man is doing the remuage, Suzanne. In other words, he's doing uh, the wine clear before we deliver the wine to you. Uh, he's bringing the sediment in the bottle to the neck of the bottle. And just afterwards, just afterwards, we will get rid of the sediment in the neck of the bottle by freezing the neck of the bottle. Then we put the final cork, we dress, the bottle with a beautiful label and we send it to you at home. <laughs> All right? Can you explain what he was doing when he held the bottle up to the light? He's watching how clean and pure is the wine. This is his responsibility. He seems to know these bottles so well. Yes, he's nursing the bottles like a nurse would watch a baby and he's doing that for 40,000 bottles a day. Oh Always the same bottle for 17 days. He's like a doctor or a nurse, responsible of his babies. He has you know? quite a responsibility. Yes, it is.
I noticed something very interesting about his hand. Could you explain to us what that is? Yes, um, this is a scenery of a, it's about bow relief, I think that's what you call it. So it's actually chiseled into the chalk wall. Right, dig the directly into chalk, and it's a scenery of a dinner party under the 18th century. And you can see uh, people having a good time and drinking champagne in uh, special glasses so that the deposit will drop down at the end of your glass. Because in those days they didn't do the remorse. Exactly. Suzanne, before we go up, I want to show you something oh very special, <laughs> which is the big bottles of Pomery. Oh. This is a Salmanazar, 12 bottles. This holds 12 bottles yes, of champagne? Yes, for your next 18th birthday party. <laughs> All right? You know the way to my heart, don't you? <laughs> I hope you were as impressed as I was with these chalk caves of Pomery. Come on upstairs, the 116 steps with me now. I have something else interesting I want to show you. This is a 75,000 liter wooden cask that was carved in 1903. It then traveled by ship to St. Louis, where it was held in an exhibition. If you look closely, you can see the American Indian, the Statue of Liberty, and other figures that celebrate the Champagne of Pomery. A tradition was formed. Fine Champagne from France had finally come to America. Seven different sizes and five different qualities to choose from. This one is the one I told you about earlier. It's the Brut Champagne that Madame Pomery took with her to promote the sales of champagne in England and Scotland. It's probably the most common, the one that everyone likes. Then there is the Brut that is specific to a certain vintage or year. The Dry Brut is a little less sweet if you want something with a little more zing to it. This one is the Pink Bubbly Rosé Brut. And the top of the line, the Madame Louise Pommery, which is a very special cuvee. The bottles are brought here by conveyor belt to be dressed, as it is called. The beautiful gold foil cap is twisted down and all the small black labels that distinguish this champagne from any others are glued onto each bottle. They are then carefully packed by hand in cartons and shipped all over the world to such countries as the West Indies, Germany, Canada, the United States, Italy and Japan. We've just come into that beautiful restaurant called Les Crayères, and the man that manages it, and also the head chef here, is Monsieur Gérard Broyer. He is rated among the five finest chefs in the entire world. Monsieur, bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Comment allez-vous? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Écoutez, avant de commencer, je vais déjà vous donner. C'est parfait. Ouais, voilà. Comme Napoléon avec son. So Josephine. Oh. Uh, you see, so. before, before we start to cook, he wants to crown me a chef also, like Napoleon did to Josephine. This is going to be a good day. Ah, Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire aujourd'hui? What ah. are we going to make today? Écoutez, euh, nous sommes en Champagne, donc nous allons faire de la cuisine au Champagne. Yeah. Alors, la cuisine au Champagne a un avantage, c'est une cuisine légère. What he's explained to me is that because we're in the land of champagne, it's appropriate that we cook with champagne. And he knows that Americans like to eat thin, non-fattening foods. And so... Alors, la cuisine légère, c'est la cuisine moderne. Et pour ce faire, nous allons vous faire un bar avec une julienne de légumes. C'est quelque chose de très léger et de si très facile à faire. Good. We're going to begin with a sea bass and some light vegetables, which we know are all very non-fattening. Le première chose à faire, c'est d'abord de préparer les légumes en julienne. The first thing that we have to do is prepare the julienne vegetables. Prepare them in the julienne style, which means slicing them very thinly. And I think he has a tool to do it. Mais les, on peut le faire à la main, mais on peut aussi le faire avec un robot. C'est beaucoup plus facile. If you'd like to, you can do it by hand with a knife in your own kitchen, or if you have a little gadget like he has, you can do that, and it's a little faster. Peel your carrots. Ça, tu vois, il faut avoir beaucoup d'amis. On commence avec les, tous les amis. On fait éplucher tous les légumes par les amis. You know, what he suggested is that you throw a big dinner party and have all your friends in the kitchen and have them do the peeling and the cutting for you. This is his interesting machine. What it's doing is thinly slicing the carrots. It's called Mondolin. 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 Mondolin is the name of the machine. Oui. It's a simple carrot cutter. On fait des petits tas comme ça. He puts them in cute little stacks. Hein? And I think what he's going to do now is take a knife. Yep. Et après, on commence à couper sa julienne. Now watch this. 
Watch how he uses that knife. Just fine, fine strips of carrots. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That's amazing. Hold on. Now he told you to use fresh vegetables. Let me explain the ones that he's using today. He has leeks, which are the large, big onions with the green stalks, about three small turnips, a good handful of green, fresh, fresh green beans, and three small sweet onions called shallots, and about three carrots. His Julian cut the rest of the vegetables like he did the carrots, and he dices the little shallots or onions and sets them aside. With those Julian vegetables in boiling salted water, you drop the carrots in and cook them for two or three minutes just to parboil them, remove them, drop the green beans in, parboil those, and remove them one at a time, setting them aside in a little dish like this. Je peux repasser sur la planche maintenant, là. Ça ne dérange pas. He salts the inside of the sea bass and then takes the cooked julienne vegetables and stuffs the inside. Si, ces légumes que nous mettons dans le bar vont le parfumer, vont lui donner une, la, leur fraîcheur. Vous voyez, comme ça. He stuffed the, the center of the bass and it's like a stuffing and it's going to flavor the fish. Alors, nous prenons une plaque. Like when you cook any fish, you take a large saucepan and butter the inside of it. Voilà. This is going to keep the fish from sticking when it's in the oven. Toujours pareil, nous ressalons le oh, fond de... look at this. He's salting the pan. Ensuite, du poivre. And peppering it. Okay, this is a new trick I've never seen before. Maybe it would work for hamburgers, too. Les échalotes hachées. And now you sprinkle the small onions into the bottom of the pan. He's actually preparing the bed to place the fish on. On pose le bar. And here's your beautiful fish in the pan. He's going to take foil and oh, put it around oh. the end of the tail because the fish cooks at a much slower rate than the tail. And if you don't do this, the tail will get burned and crispy. Voilà. <laughs> okay, now it's yeah. ready. You know, champagne can be used in lots of different kinds of cooking. We're working today with a sea bass, but it can be used to cook other kinds of fish or poultry. It's great for chicken or turkey if you'd like to try it there, too. So he's put about a half a bottle of the champagne on. What, do we drink the rest? Two of us. <laughs> the two of us, sure. <laughs> oh, not in the yeah. oven. We put the fish on the stove on a medium flame, and we wait for those champagne bubbles to start to boil. And then we place the fish into the oven and cook it for about 27 to 30 minutes. I wish I were that fish swimming in that delicious champagne. <laughs> And now those bubbles of champagne have started to boil, and so we put the fish into an oven that's been preheated to about 300 degrees. One thing I saw that you didn't is several times during that 30 minutes, Monsieur Boyer basted the fish with the champagne sauce that's in the dish. You still have the champagne juice that's left from the fish being cooked in the oven, so pour that into a saucepan on a medium flame. It's about two cups of liquid. We're going to let this mixture boil on the mm -hmm. flame, and it just boils and boils, so the steam takes away some of the liquid. We only want half of this liquid to be left by the time we make our sauce. And I think it's important to keep stirring it, too, so it doesn't stick, because you do have some of the vegetables in there still. Environ uh, un quart de litre. Okay, and now we're going to take the cream, and it looks like fresh whipping cream to me, and he says about a quarter of a liter, and very slowly, it's poured into the boiling champagne mixture. Okay, we're going to let it boil, come to a boil again. Remember, it is milk, and so it will scorch unless you continue to stir it. minutes. <laughs> Now, while the cream mixture is boiling on the stove for about five yeah. minutes... J'enlève sa robe. <laughs> oh, in French, he takes off the robe. He's removing the, the scaly skin of the mm -hmm. fish. This is what distinguishes him as a great chef. He knows that this is ready because when he dips his ladle in, the, the cream sauce mixture forms a coating all over the back of the ladle, smooth and even. Voilà. So it's boiled long enough and it's ready. Environ 200 grammes. 
He drops bit by bit the butter into this boiling cream mixture and stirs it very briskly. It's the slow process of the butter melting into the cream that makes the sauce. And the sauce starts to thicken as the butter melts into it. Pour finir, le sel, to hein, finish it, it's salted and peppered. Foie. And now the sauce is ready and he carefully bon. pours it all over our beautiful sea bass. And it's ready to serve to our guests. So let's go now to the table and eat this beautiful dish. And this is the surprise. Oh, and the sauce looks delicious. Maybe in French, but that's fish. No. Le bar. I think it's sea bass in the States. Right? Yes, sea bass, we call it. And it's beautiful. The French use the, the vegetables that they slice so thin. It's amazing. Bon appétit, Jacques. Bon appétit, Jacques. You taste the. The, the wine, I taste the it. champagne in your soul. And there's lemon too. Champagne. And um, that's the miracle of champagne. It, that's, it, it fits. It's almost favorite thing. Isn't it? It's a fine champagne to share with friends, isn't it? Thank you, Suzanne. Thank à votre santé. Ah, merci. It's a beautiful moment to share with you. Santé. À votre santé, Jacques. <laughs> Jules, à ta santé. Merci, Charles. <laughs> the castle is situated in a beautiful park. Does uh, Henry own all of this land yes, too? Yes, the park, sure. And you know that from the castle, you're watching the cathedral, and this is the cathedral where all the all the kings, the of, kings France of France were crowned. crowned. Yes. So while you're having your dinner and having a good time with champagne and sharing a moment with friends, you're looking over history. This looks like a castle where we are. Well, it is a castle. It used to be a family castle yes. belonging to the Polignac family. And a few months ago, Pomery restored the castle, yes, and it's now beautiful. a beautiful restaurant, as you can see, under the oh. management of Gérard Boyer. Mm. You know, this real champagne is so different from what I'm used to drinking in the United States, and I really like it because it's not real sweet. When you drink high-quality champagne, you actually feel the bubbles in your nose. And it's the sensation to your nose and to your mouth that makes the experience so pleasant. Suzanne, à votre santé. Oh, merci. À votre santé, Suzanne. Oh, merci beaucoup. Notre has agreed today to prepare another dessert, the Saint Honoré Chantilly. And believe me, from the list of ingredients, I think you're going to enjoy this. He has started with um, two cups of sugar and four spoonfuls of water and five drops of lemon juice. And those are cooking on the stove. And when they cook long enough, they turn into a kind of caramel. He explains that you will know that they're ready when this syrup turns a deep, a kind of a goldish brown color and that's how you know that it's turning into caramel and that it's ready. Le Note takes little bignot cookies which are made by General Biscuit of France and he dips them into the caramel sauce and puts them on a special kind of wax paper to cool. He cautions you, though, that this has to be done very carefully because the syrup, of course, is boiling hot and you don't want to burn your fingers. And it also must be done very quickly because the caramel sauce is starting to cool and you have to dip the cookies in before the caramel sauce gets too cool. If you want, he says, you can kind of stab the cookie on a fork and dip it in so that you can protect your fingers. The wax paper, of course, won't let the caramel stick. And now Le Note takes eight palmito cookies, another cookie that's made by Lou, and uses a technique he describes that pastry cooks all over the world use. He dips it carefully, quickly, into the caramel sauce and sets those to dry again on the wax paper. When the caramel sauce on the cookies finally cools, we can begin the cream preparation. Cold liquid cream, about a pint, is poured into a chilled blender 
and beat it very, very rapidly for a few minutes. He explains now that all of these recipes are in his book that was written by his daughter Sylvie. Into the stiffened whipped cream, Lenotre adds three tablespoons of granulated sugar and one teaspoon of vanilla. And now the Chantilly cream is finished. Now before you begin, you are to have ready one prepared pie crust that you can make yourself or purchase from a store. Lenotre also has the recipe in his book. Watch how Lenotre takes the whipped cream and voilà. puts it carefully into his pastry Bien bag that has a decorating nozzle attached. See how he holds the bag with his hands Bien and he puts Bien pressure Bien. on the bag as he squeezes the whipped cream into the pie crust. He starts by going around the edge and then he makes little circles with the cream. He's slowly filling in this pie crust until it's filled with whipped cream. Oh, this looks great! What he does now is take little Binyu cookies from Lou, again, and arranges them very carefully around the outside for decoration and see how the caramel glaze that he had dipped it into makes the cookies shine. It's, it's a very pretty, pretty dessert. Very appetizing. It makes me hungry watching him. The dessert is finished off with the palmito cookies, the big ones that he dipped in caramel, and in the center of the dessert he places the palmitos around like a beautiful rose. The cake serves eight people, and it is the Saint Honoré Chantilly, made with Bignou and Palmito cookies of Lou from General Biscuit. Le Notre says now, my friends, bon appétit. Part of this show is brought to you by Brie Cheese from Gerard. You know, France has been termed by food lovers everywhere as the cheese capital of the world. And one of the culinary traditions can be found in one of its most famous cheeses, Brie by Gerard. Just to look at the cheese is so appetizing. It has a tissue-thin crust that protects the soft, creamy inside. The French say that it has a sympathetic roundness. You know, we are in the region right now where Brie cheese is produced. And one of the producers of highest quality is Gerard. Part of its specialty is because Gerard always has consistency in its cheeses. So taste with me the French way of life. Eat Brie by Gerard.